You might have seen the title of this episode and wondered to yourself, why is Eric doing an episode on Maine? Maine is a U.S. state. It is not an other state of America. And if you're a true diehard of the show, you've already recognized that I'm not doing an episode on the Plymouth Colony. So again, you might say to yourself, this is the Other States of America History Podcast. How is he doing an episode on Maine and not Plymouth? Well, I'll answer that question right now. You get the worst social studies student and ask them to tell you something about the colony of Plymouth, they would say something. They would have some nugget of information. Everybody knows Plymouth. It features prominently in every U.S. social studies textbook. There is absolutely no reason for me to feature it on this show. But let's flip the script. You ask the best social studies student about Maine, and they will repeat something like this back to you. Maine was a creation of the Compromise of 1820, the Missouri Compromise. Missouri wanted to enter the Union as a slave state, which would have thrown off the equal balance between slave and free states. And so as part of the Compromise, Maine, which was a chunk of Massachusetts at the time, also seeking its own independent statehood, would be allowed into the Union as its own separate state and a free state at that, thus maintaining the balance between free and slave states. That is the story of the creation of Maine. Now, as much as that little chunk is true in 1820, that is not the beginning of Maine. Maine is not an offshoot of Massachusetts, at least not in the time period that we will be going to. And the colony of Maine or the province of Maine, as it was known at the time, is actually an older English institution than the Massachusetts Bay Company. Now, hopefully that piqued your interest. Because in this episode, we're going to be traveling a little north from our last episode, learning about a time and place where the English in New England were not overwhelmingly Puritan or Separatist, and uncovering New Hampshire's secret sister colony. So enough teasing, let's just begin the episode. If you've been listening to this season, then you already know that the English actually had a, a fairly rich history in northern New England as compared to southern New England. From Newfoundland, the natural outgrowth of these expanding fishing operations found their way to Maine quite early on to also indulge in some fur trading. We know in the very least they had set up what you would call summer colonies or even summer camps, seasonal fishing and fur trading camps that they would leave in the winter in order to go back home, sell their goods and begin again. We also know about the failed Popham colony financed by Sir John Popham and Sir Ferdinando Gorgias. And these summer colonies and the Popham colony all take place before 1620, before the separatists of Leiden land at Plymouth. Popham Colony is well known, of course, and you can listen to our episode on that. But all these small little clandestine operations, uh, little, little colonial outposts that were developed in order to return a profit to somebody, they remain very secretive, of course. Someone's making money off of this. It's not widely known. There are scant references to operations up and down the coast of Maine, Monhegan Island, and Damaris Cove. The details are scant, but the sources from which we hear of these little tiny English outposts are widely spread. And so there is some validity to the fact that there was a very real English presence in what we would now call Maine long before the Pilgrims ever showed up in what we would now call Massachusetts. And in fact, when the Pilgrims did show up, these separatists, they were greeted at first not by Tisquantum, Squanto, as many people assert, they were greeted by Samoset who was likely an Abenaki, who had learned some English from traders off the coast of Monhegan Island, again, in the area that we're talking about. Yes, the line of communication that forged the great alliance between the Wampanoag and the Plymouth settlers in 1621 actually began further up the coast over something more mundane like trade goods. But again, any sense of order or record-keeping among the English who lived in what is now Maine and parts of New Hampshire is just non-existent, and it, it will mostly remain that way throughout our entire episode. The Wild West actually starts right here. This is the frontier of Anglophone civilization on the North American continent. Enough rambling. After the fall of the Popham Colony, the Virginia Company of London, which of course financed Jamestown, began to very slowly take off and become successful. By the late 16-teens, this company was seeking to cannibalize its failed sister company, the fledgling Virginia Company of Plymouth, which, of course, 
was authorized by King James I to colonize what is now New England, parts of Nova Scotia, all the way down to New York City with some overlap with the Southern Company. The London Company took efforts to sweep the French out of this territory and began gobbling up the best fishing grounds. Sir Ferdinando Gorgias took offense to this on behalf of his company and actually became quite desperate to maintain any sort of legitimacy for the Plymouth Company. So when the Separatists of Leiden, of course, sailed for the New World in 1620, he didn't much care that they had strange views not compatible with his own. The Virginia Company of Plymouth was reorganized as the Council for New England. Revitalized with a name change, into 1621, Sir Ferdinando Gorgias, as president of the Council for New England, began to insist that fishermen choosing to fish off the coast of New England uh, must buy a license from the council. Now, many of these fishermen protested. Entire port cities off the coast of England who depended on this revenue protested, claiming they had been fishing there for generations and that this new council provided no amenities, no services, no protections that they had not previously enjoyed. Why should they pay for a license? These merchants, especially from the port of Bristol, who had been enjoying fishing in that area for a very, very long time, going back almost to the time of Giovanni Caboto, request from the King's Privy Council any sort of documentation about this new Council for New England, pleading complete ignorance. At the same time, the Council for New England is helping to legitimize Plymouth, the Pilgrim Settlement. In June of 1621, they issue the Pierce Patent to the Pilgrims, giving them the right to settle. Now, Plymouth hadn't actually been given the right to govern, but merely allowed to organize themselves until proper government could be installed. Moving right into 1622, this would be a high mark for the Council for New England, as their competitor, the London Company in Jamestown, suffered a horrific surprise attack from the Powhatan natives and effectively stemmed their incursions on the Northern Company's territory. Also, in November of this year, there was a royal proclamation confirming the Council for New England's right to issue fishing licenses. And so the fishermen were shut down unless they would pay up. And in this very same year, we see the creation of a legal Maine. And so in August of 1622, Sir Ferdinando Gorgias, along with his business partner and fellow council member, Sir John Mason, grant themselves through their own council what they call the Province of Maine which was to run between the Merrimack and Kennebec rivers, which would now constitute the southern part of the state of Maine, the eastern part of the state of New Hampshire, and a little tiny slice of modern-day Massachusetts. Bringing it back to a point I made several minutes ago, rather than Maine being a 19th century spinoff of Massachusetts, Maine exists as an English proprietary colony when Massachusetts is firmly a Native American nation, and anything resembling the Massachusetts Bay Colony, only a twinkle in the eye of a few men from Dorchester. And right in 1622, Mason and Gorgias immediately begins piecing out Maine to different fishing and fur trading operations, including many that they invested in themselves. And between the years of 1622 and 1624, the king had dissolved Parliament. And so all the various fishing towns off the coast of England that had been petitioning people in Parliament to do something about this new council for New England, their efforts were squashed on, on pause for now. And if they wanted to continue doing business off the coast of Maine, they would have to pay for a license. Things are going very well for Gorgias. De facto colonies would have to be legitimized. 1622, the very same year, Monhegan Island is bought by Abraham Jennings of Plymouth. In doing so, the council for New England handed Jennings probably what was already a number of structures and a dock and some drying skates, all built by other men. We know that Gorgias himself took over Damaris Cove, which he may have had some investments in prior to his own council, going all the way back to just after the Popham colony. In an account written down by John Pory, working for the competitor of the Virginia Company, he mentions that in 1622, Damaris Cove already has farms, winter habitations, and a palisade with a cannon. And so, when some authors assert that there was no English settlement before 1622 in Maine, I find it quite unbelievable because suddenly in 1622, there are signs of a lived-in space, not just a trading post and some freshly broken ground. 
Gorgias had 13 men working at Damaris Cove. And throughout the province of Maine, Mason and Gorgias's various settlers were not settlers in the sense of Plymouth or the later Massachusetts colony. These were settlers more akin to those down in Virginia, many of them indentured servants. There were some wealthy folks who were able to purchase land from Gorgias and Mason, but not usually the right to govern themselves. These were not particularly religious men. Um, on Damaris Cove, a maypole was discovered, much as we saw with the Marymount Colony. These were salt-of-the-earth, rough-and-rowdy people, many of them with no other option but to be flung into the new world to do hard labor. And now you must be asking yourself, how did Ferdinando Gorgias and Mason, how did they intend to govern this large province of Maine? Well, coming into the year 1622 and 23, it becomes very clear based on the grant that they received from their own Council for New England and the actions of that council that Maine was not to be its own colony in the sense that it was governed by someone and over them would be the council and the king. All of New England was to be governed by Sir Ferdinando's own son, Robert Gorgias. Now, if you recall, in the years 1623 and 24, Gorgias set up his own little colony at the former site of Wessagusset, which the settlers abandoned amidst trouble with the natives. Now, Gorgias was to be the royal governor general of all of New England. Under him would be representatives from Plymouth. There would also be an admiral in charge of protecting the coast and collecting licenses. And then, in the direction of Maine, a character we've already met before in our Wessagusset episode, there was this guy named Christopher Levitt. Levitt, in this tiered structure, of colony and super colony was the representative from Maine. He was to be Robert Gorgias's assistant to that particular area, which was also partially owned by his father. And in fact, all of New England was carved up by different lords who were on the council for New England in big long strips. And this was confirmed by the king. The council agreed that those settlers already present on the land would of course get to keep their land, but fall under the jurisdiction of one of these lords, and then everything at another level would again be governed by Gorgias's son, who would again be subject to the council, who again is subject to the king. Now, if you've listened to the Robert Gorgias's episode, you know that this all falls apart. Robert Gorgias gets cold feet, and he was supposed to be the, the top of the hierarchical pyramid in New England, and he decides to return home. The funding isn't there, the manpower isn't there, it all falls apart which the Plymouth settlers, of course, loved because now they were again in charge of themselves by de facto, not by de jure. The same applied to Levitt and all of the other patent holders in Mason and Gorge's colony of Maine. They were left to their own. And so we've already talked about some fishing camps or potential settlement before 1622-23, but let's just focus on Levitt and then move on to some other minor characters just to give you a survey of the situation in the 1620s. In 1623, Christopher Levitt was granted 6,000 acres by the Council for New England in the province of Maine at his discretion with river access. He just needed to survey the coast and he needed to select his spot and report it back to the council. The interesting thing here that often gets underplayed is that English authorities expected that these settlers were to make it right with the natives. At this early time anyway, you can get a grant back in England, but you'll have to purchase or come to some agreement with the natives on the land for your occupying it, which is unexpected when you think about the stereotypes involved with colonization. But again, we're at a very early date here. Also, as we found out in this podcast, that, you know, you show up with 10 or 12 guys or even 40 or 50 guys and you start a little tiny settlement. If you don't have good relations with the natives, things are going to fall apart very quickly. Plymouth had fantastic relations with the Wampanoag, at least in the 1620s under Osemaquin. But if you look at the earlier Popham colony, a little further up the coast, they didn't even have bad relations with the natives, just cold, distant relations, confusing relations with the natives, and the colony falls apart. And if you have bad relations with the natives, just look at the first Wessagusset colony. And you'll have to look real quick because it existed for a very short amount of time for that specific reason. Perhaps a life lesson to Christopher Levitt as he was inspecting the coast, he found the former Popham colony. And so Levitt, finding a nice harbor, nice bay, would talk to the natives in the area. In the fall of 1623, he talks to a couple different Sagamores, 
one of which he records the name as Somerset, which is likely Samoset, the man who first made contact with the Plymouth settlers in 1621. If Somerset is the same as Samoset, or even if they knew each other, we know that these natives, probably Abenaki, in this specific area had pretty good relations with the English fur traders and fishermen. So much so, Samoset had a decent command of the English language and was friendly towards the English. And so they invited him to settle in the area. They gave him a couple of choices. The place where he ultimately set up a trading post was House Island. But Levitt's personal 6,000 acres, he decided to take in around the modern day city of York, Maine, which he records as having a good harbor, plenty of fish and game, and already full of English ships. And so who might these other English people be? Well, other than Levitt, Gorgias had a large patent of land along the Agamenticus River. Gorgias planned for this to be a big settlement, and he put Francis Norton in charge of it. This would be the future town of York. Mason, with some help from Gorgias, began his own little settlement off the Piscataqua River for fishing, salt making, and lumber. The Council for New England recorded that this same year in 1623, Little Harbor was settled by David Thompson. Some of these places, of course, being in modern-day New Hampshire. Again, the province of Maine at this time was quite large and encompassed the coastline of what would now be New Hampshire. Christopher Levitt records in 1625 that as of 1623, the same year that we're settling in, John Brown of Bristol was granted land by the natives in the area of New Harbor, Maine. I only bring up these separate, isolated, little tiny settlements to underscore the point that, yes, there were a lot of English people in Maine, but they didn't have any sort of cohesion or organization that Plymouth would have or the later Massachusetts colony. So let's just drop you down in Maine. What would it have been like to work along the coast? Here's a quote from the historian Charles E. Clark. When turbulent fishing crews swelled the population, the leading employers assumed the authority of the magistrates by invoking agent precedent. This procedure, which had become institutionalized under the name of Newfoundland Law. In other words, as the gorgeous government failed to solidify each fishing crew, fur trading operation, lumbering crew, they were a law unto themselves. Your overseer was also your magistrate, your judge. A term we might use today would be a kangaroo court. And honestly, even though Gorgias's and Mason's province of Maine extended hundreds of miles inland, the English really only controlled pockets of the coast and only at the will of the Native Americans who accepted them because of the trade goods they would be able to provide. Many of these small outfits just simply disappeared. We just don't have record of them after a certain date. It's likely some of them were wiped out by the natives when relations went sour. Or even the native practice of shunning would cause somebody to go out of business. This, for example, is what happened to the aforementioned David Thompson, who was a clerk for Gorgeous, had his own grant of land, opened up a trading company, it was unsuccessful, and then he died miserably. But overall, 1623 seems to have been a pretty successful year for the province of Maine. But of course, in 1624, the Robert Gorgeous government that I've mentioned before never comes to fruition. Maine is on its own. Parliament is back in session. And the House of Commons condemns these licenses that the Council for New England is extracting for fishing along the coast of New England. And if you listen to the Pilgrim Fathers and their records, it was kind of a non-issue at this point because the admiral in charge of collecting these fees simply couldn't extract enough fees to pay himself and provide any sort of profit for the council or Gorgeous himself. So by the end of the year, he was out of a job anyway. With no law or order, the Plymouth Pilgrims began setting up a chain of trading posts all along the coast into modern-day Maine. Some were authorized by Gorgeous and Mason, some weren't. There were few, aside from the natives, who could stop them. Let's turn back to Christopher Levitt, the one pseudo-authority left in Maine. Well, in the summer of 1624, he leaves 10 men at House Island and he goes back to England. Gorgeous tasked him with recruiting for the Maine colony. This was mostly unsuccessful. Perhaps the news of the two failed Wessagusa colonies in the last two years made New England not such a sunny prospect. Not that Gorgeous would have too much time to pay attention to his faraway colony. Come 1624, relations between England and Spain were beginning to sour again, and his main duty was commander of the fort at Plymouth, a strategic outpost along the coast. If you dig through his correspondences from the time, 
they concern less and less with New England and more and more on domestic affairs. Another armada could be coming at any time. Moving into 1625, although immigration had greatly diminished into the main colony, we know that a small settlement was started on the Pemaquid River, again emanating from organizers in Bristol, England. Also 1625 into 1626, there are more Plymouth stations along the coast, and now they're competing with Marymount stations. If that sounds familiar, it's because it was the subject of our last episode. Thomas Morton had a short-lived colony called Marymount. There are very few people in this colony, but Thomas Morton decided to live like a Native American male, and they greatly enjoyed his company. And because the natives valued their relationship with him, he got some choice deals and was able to obtain furs far cheaper than the Plymouth settlers were able to get them for. And so he had competing trading stations up along the coast. Historians cite this as one of the possible reasons, real reasons, why Morton is ultimately captured by Miles Standish and sent back to England. But Morton returns more than once, and ultimately he will feed back into our main story, so keep him in mind. And as the Marymount stations are going up, Monhegan Island is sold. Abraham Jennings bought it in 1622. Here we are in 1626, he sells the entire island again to some Bristol merchants. So there are signs of slow growth, money being made, prosperous times. In the same year, back to that Pemaquid settlement, in the year or so since they had settled, they had grown enough that they now had a magistrate, Abraham Shirt. All of these seem like disconnected facts, and that's because they are. We really don't have a full picture of what was going on off the coast of Maine. They didn't create a unified set of records like the Pilgrim Fathers would. But if you just listen to what I said and you take it all in, you could see that there was a lot of English people there, more than your traditional textbook will ever tell you. I turn to the historian Charles Knowles Bolton. He says, Indeed, there were hundreds of European men in Maine and New Hampshire in 1626, or more than double the number in those in Massachusetts. But remember, Gorgeous is now distracted. What about Mason? Well, in 1626, Mason becomes the treasurer and paymaster for all the English military. Again, with the ever-present threat of Spain, now Mason is distracted. But again, there's still a steady trickle of Englishmen into Maine, and this is before the Massachusetts Bay Company ever even existed. 1627, Edward Hilton began a settlement in Dover, and this, of course, again, was funded by Bristol merchants and some of the merchants out of Shrewsbury. By this year, we know that some of the rejects from Plymouth and some of the settlers of the failed West Augusta colonies found their way up to different operations in Maine. So even a little overland migration of Englishmen. We know that Spurwink, Maine was settled by Richard Tucker and Richard Bradshaw. But then around the same time, the trading station on Richmond Island fell apart because its owner, John Burgess Sr. died. But besides the ins and outs, the most important thing that happened in the history of English Maine anyway in 1627 was that Christopher Levitt, on recommendation of the Council for New England, was proclaimed governor by the king of those parts. That's in quotes, those parts. Not terribly specific, but it's again the beginning of building some sort of order beside the hyper-local level. Now, what's interesting here is Christopher Levitt wasn't in New England at the time. He also wasn't in any rush to return to the area of Maine. And so he'll show up in our story when we get to 1630. Entering the year 1628, the Council for New England is now presided over by the Earl of Warwick, a leading Puritan lord. And Gorgeous and Mason, while still part of the council, while still having heavy shares in the council, are again absorbed with other matters. And so the Earl of Warwick uses his position to enhance an earlier grant given to the Dorchester Company for the rights to fishing grounds around Cape Ann. We have an episode on this. It's a couple back. The Dorchester Company falls apart. It becomes the New England Company. And then that quickly changes into the Massachusetts Bay Company, which, of course, founds the Massachusetts Bay Colony. But the council under Warwick gave the company the unusual power to govern, not just run the settlement, their operations, but to have some level of legal jurisdiction over it. Now, just like the Popham Colony or the Council for New England itself, 
or the failed Robert Gorgeous attempt at a New England colony, this would be governed in England by a council, essentially a company, a shareholding company, and then they would elect some sort of representative to be the manager in the new world. They would give them a title of lieutenant governor, governor, deputy governor, uh, <laughs> governor general. But only by the authority of this council in England would this governor then have any power in the new world. This was the proper way to set up a colony in England at this time. It was the emerging mercantilist system. So the colony only exists to benefit the mother country. And so the headquarters of the company that runs the colony should be in the mother country. The products that are coming out of that colony should go to the mother country. It's an octopus extending its arms. It's not a animal budding itself or creating little versions of itself elsewhere that go on to become independent. That was never the plan. I turned to the historian Thomas Jefferson Wurtenbacher concerning what the Massachusetts Bay Company was up to. They were careful that no hint of their purpose should reach the ears of King Charles, for well they knew that he would never knowingly consent to the establishment of a semi-independent state. While the Massachusetts Bay Company was originally run out of England, its own council in England voted to remove themselves to the New World. And thus, instead of being what we would call now a corporate board managing a property far away, they now became a government. This was something Mason and Gorgeous never intended to happen, especially since it was a Puritan government. I only bring this up because the new Massachusetts colony is going to be quite a threat to Maine. But in the very same year, 1628, to the north of what you would now know as Maine, King Charles insisted that the Council for New England lop off the top of its domain, which it did. And that top end became Nova Scotia, New Scotland, a place that still exists to this day. So naturally, above New England would be New Scotland. And so the greater province of Maine just got quite a large haircut. But fortunately, in 1629, the wars with Spain and France were winding down. Gorgeous and Mason again turned their attention to the council, and they were shocked by what had been going on in their absence. Gorgeous especially took offense to the Massachusetts Bay Company. He felt that their original grant and the subsequent ones given out by the council were a subgrant. And that between him and his son and their, the council's authority, the Massachusetts Bay Company was still subservient to any order they would decide to put over them. Gorgeous, looking to the south, declares that the Massachusetts Bay Company received its grants deceptively. The investors in the Bay Company managed to go over the head of the Council for New England and confirm their grant with the king himself. Not looking good for the council. Massachusetts has quite a head start on Mason Gorgeous at this point because they are going to inundate the area with their own people. The Puritan exodus is coming. And so with renewed attention in 1629, Gorgeous and Mason decide to split up the large province of Maine into two separate colonies, one for each. Mason takes the more southerly chunk and he calls it New Hampshire or New Hampshire. And of course, this colony is the forerunner to the modern day state of New Hampshire, which is one of the original 13 colonies, very well established in your child's history book, not within the scope of this podcast. But what is in the scope of this podcast is the secret sister colony of New Hampshire that eventually disappears that you've never heard about. That was Gorgeous's chunk. He named it New Somersetshire, which more or less overlaps a large chunk of Maine today, considering at this point Nova Scotia was already taken off the top and New Hampshire the bottom. The two men were still committed to work together and organize together, but they thought that having two separate colonies in this large, vast chunk of land would be better. And for the head of their respective governments, they created the position of what they just called an agent. And the agent in New Hampshire would be Captain Walter Neal. And then the agent for Maine would be Captain Thomas Wigan. Each colony still at this time is very much a coastal enterprise. And so ship captains like these two men were acceptable authorities to run just such uh, a pair of colonies. For their own self-interests, Mason and Gorgeous formed a company, 1629, called the Laconia Company sometimes called the Ligonia Company because of the later colony, its purpose was to find a way west of Maine 
to get to what they deemed the Lake of the Iroquois. Now, this could have been Lake Champlain. It could have been the upper reaches of the St. Lawrence. It could be Lake Ontario. It could just be an amalgamation of all these different bodies of water that are near the Haudenosaunee. Open up relations with the Iroquois and siphon off business from the New Netherland colony, which at this point was centered along the Hudson River and the subject of the first season of this podcast. One interesting thing is that inside of the Council for New England grant for Mason and Gorgeous Ligonia, it includes the ability for Ligonia to be self-governing. Those at the head of that government, of course, would be Mason and Gorgeous. But by 1630, the entire operation falls apart and this claim is resold without removing that self-government power. As you can imagine, this is going to cause an incident. And this will show up in our next episode. But despite the Ligonia Company and New Somersetshire and New Hampshire, there's still some lawlessness going on along the coast. This new agent system didn't really take hold. We know that the men of Plymouth were still exacting their justice when necessary. In 1630, they arrest Edward Ashley, who's operating a trading house in the area of the Penobscot Native Nation. Well, Ashley was selling them firearms, which was illegal by this point in time by English law. They arrested him and found no authority in Maine to try him and shipped him back to England, much as they had done uh, just previously to Thomas Morton. And in both cases, the Plymouth settlers took over their trading posts. Thomas Morton, who would become an ally of Maine, in 1630, he arrives back in the New World after being shipped to England, and this time has to deal with the Massachusetts Bay Colony, which didn't exist when he was here previously for Marymount. They put him in stocks, then they burn his house to the ground. They send him back to England. He arrives at the Port of Plymouth again with another death sentence over his head. Somehow, this man, again, trained as a lawyer, talks Gorgeous into a long-lasting business partnership. And now Gorgeous and Morton began to formulate a plan to strengthen New Hampshire, strengthen New Somersetshire, strengthen the overall structure of New England under the Council for New England, and destroy the Massachusetts Bay Colony. So we, again, we have the building of some momentum here. As we learned in previous episodes, all the non-separatists in Plymouth and the non-Puritans in the Massachusetts Colony Many of them feel alienated. Some of them are outright kicked out. And so New Hampshire, New Somersetshire, again, they get a little bit of that overland English migration starting to pour in. In the same year, the settlement of Sheepscot is founded by 84 families. We have families showing up. That means natural increase. John Oldham from our earlier Massachusetts episodes, along with Richard Vines, who had been in Maine as early as 1616, 1617 for a while, received the rights to what is now Biddleford. At the same time, Thomas Lewis and Richard Boynington receive a grant of land from the Council for New England around the modern-day city of Saco under the agreement that they bring 50 people with them. And in summation, by 1630, there was a bustling, growing community of English people who were not these staunch religious Puritans or separatist types. Moving into the year 1631, Christopher Levitt shows up again in New England after being gone for several years. Technically, he's the governor of those parts, whatever that means. But since being given that title, the Plymouth Colony has been given a little more legitimacy. The Massachusetts Bay Colony has been invented, and Maine has been split into two separate entities. He effectively found himself to be an antique without any clear role or power in the area. On his return voyage to England, he dies, and they give him a burial at sea, and thus ends the life of the only man who seemed to have any real authority in Maine during the 1620s. I know I'm bouncing around, but I want to keep everything on the timeline. Back to England. Now, Morton is in England, Thomas Morton, and he hates the Massachusetts Bay Colony. He hates Plymouth. Morton's a lawyer. Morton is now being retained by Gorgeous. Gorgeous, as commander of the fort at Plymouth, he gets to hear all sorts of things from New England. And... He comes to the realization that this Massachusetts Bay Company is not what it claimed to have been. He hears all the scuttlebutt. Not only that, but because he made this council for New England and they enabled this, what people will soon be calling a commonwealth, 
Gorgias comes under some suspicion for being a Puritan sympathizer, which is something he outright rejects. He's a high Anglican and a great supporter of the king. And so he can't have this association, especially in the times when the Puritans are starting to lean towards the parliament and parliament is starting to break with the king and two sides are developing in a future civil war. Now, with himself under the microscope, he was resolved to get rid of the Earl of Warwick, get him off of that council, at least out of the president's role. But in 1631, right before Gorgias is able to do that and reassume control of his own council, the Earl grants a bunch of land in what is now southern New England to a few Puritan lords. This will become important in future episodes. But he sneaks that by right before Gorgias is able to reassert himself. Gorgias, along with Mason, along with the lawyer Thomas Morton, and many other people, come together and they turn the council from this organization that was enabling these Puritans and separatist types to an organization that has some authority to try to cancel out their claims and then appeal to the king in an effort to undo what Gorgias inadvertently had a hand in creating and was besmirching his good name. As such, it appears that efforts to really establish a formal government in New Somersetshire begins to fall apart or never really gelled in the first place. And at the same time, Mason and Gorgias' businesses in their respective colonies become less interesting to them or less profitable or less promising. They sell the Ligonia patent to a group of religious people who are called the husbandmen. They are nonconformist types, similar to the Puritans, but different in some key features, not terribly important right now. But again, inside of that patent is the ability to govern yourself, which will backfire on Gorgias later on. We know at the same time, 1631, the Dixie Bull, who's a pirate, terrorizes the coast of New Somersetshire. Gorgias manages to scrape together some money and send a fleet after him. Could never catch him. The French, at their very own colony of Acadia, which very much overlapped Nova Scotia and parts of New Somersetshire, would occasionally raid the coast. One of Plymouth's trading posts along the Penobscot was robbed by Frenchmen at gunpoint. And even without outside forces like pirates and Frenchmen and Puritans in the south, the mismanaged and overlapping land claims that came out of the Council for New England, using inferior maps, not really understanding the inland areas of New Somersetshire, New Hampshire, create internal conflicts. We know that a man by the name of George Cleave, who will be very important in the next episode, was pushed off his land repeatedly by a man named Trelawney and the men working for him. The Plymouth men who kept being run off by the French appealed to different settlements in Maine for help. They weren't willing to help. The people in Maine had no unity even onto themselves. They're not going to help out the people from Plymouth competing for the same source of furs. The people of New Somersetshire and New Hampshire felt no affinity for the people of Massachusetts or Plymouth on a religious level or even terribly on the level of being the same ethnicity. I turn to the historian John Pomfret. Maine attracted a different type of settler than Plymouth or Massachusetts. These men from the west country of England, scattered along the coast, from Piscataqua to Casco Bay, were seamen and adventurers who cared nothing about religious dogma or church reform. The enterprisers themselves were of the landed gentry, loyalists in sympathy, and adherents of the established church. Back in England, things weren't looking too much better for the separatist and Puritan types. Thomas Morton crafted an elegant petition on behalf of Gorgias to present in front of the Privy Council, which sits under the King, not part of Parliament, complaining about the overreach of the Massachusetts Bay Company and containing the accusation that Massachusetts was planning to rebel against the Crown, which would mean simply operate as an independent state. While that's happening, Morton writes letters to everyone he can, and he lays out his story and his version of the story. And if you've seen the episode on Mount Wollaston and Marymount, you already know it, where the pilgrims presented him as a libertine and someone who embraced the paganism of the natives and ancient England itself in order to satisfy his own carnal needs. Morton portrayed himself as a small-time businessman who was operating a trading post and was continuously pushed out by these intolerant religious fanatics. If you read his letters, they're full of biblical allegories and references. Morton would use these references as a tool to manipulate people, 
to appeal to their common religion, wherein Morton is a biblical figure like Jonah, where the Puritans and Separatists are Philistines and Sadducees. While things moved slowly in the Privy Council, the Council for New England itself asked the Massachusetts Bay Colony to return its charter for inspection so it could be confirmed. They did this in 1632, 33, 34. Massachusetts never sends it. To frustrate Gorgeous even further, the Massachusetts Bay Colony had begun to boom, creating financial gains for even the Plymouth Colony, who now had a consumer base, and now suddenly raising livestock was a healthy trade in Plymouth. Back in England, Puritan lords were still buying out old properties in what is New Somersetshire and New Hampshire. Many of the Bristol merchants would sell properties to men like the Lord Say and Seal and Lord Brooke, who by their names, you can tell, had a lot of money and influence. While the council was clamping down on this Puritan overreach, they were still able to buy previously sold chunks of land and at times install their own local magistrates. And with the growing divide between the king and parliament, the Puritan lords, they really didn't have a lot of pull with the king. Gorgeous and Mason did. So come 1633 and 34, the Privy Council creates the Commission for Foreign Plantations, which for our purposes you could call the Commission for Foreign Colonies, the Commission for Overseas English Possessions. This comes about as a direct result of Gorgeous and Mason's complaints. And who they put in charge of this commission was Archbishop Loud, notorious for his persecution of Puritans, a notorious high Anglican, of course. And the Privy Council delegates all of its power over the colonies into this commission. One thing the Privy Council specifically didn't like was the exodus of people from England. It's an old thought, but uh, the French Empire suffered from the same symptom whereby you want your people in your country. And if people are leaving your country, even to expand your country into colonies, some people saw that as a weakness, as depopulating your centers of power. The commission saw it that way. Even if they did have strange beliefs, having the bodies in your country was to your benefit. But even with the creation of this commission and the Privy Council being aware of these issues and Gorgeous and Mason having turned their attention fully towards the Puritans to the to the detriment of their own businesses, it might have been too late. By 1633, there's a lot of people in Massachusetts, a lot of English people. And the same year, 1633, Plymouth finally pays off its debts to its investors. It's essentially without lien. And now the two colonies combined create a system of self-sufficiency. Rolling into the year 1634, Gorgeous finally receives the authority of the Privy Council through the commission to take the Massachusetts Charter, and he is further given the authority to install a new government over all of New England, canceling out any previous governments he deems fit. And so Gorgeous isn't asking anymore. He's not just asking to review the charter on his council. He, he demands it. It's, it should be coming in his direction. Massachusetts still doesn't send it. And moving into Massachusetts history for a little bit, which again is outside of the scope of this podcast, but you never hear about this in history class, the Massachusetts Bay Colony begins to prepare for an invasion. Not an invasion of natives or the French, an invasion of the English under Gorgeous. The militia drills increase. The fortifications are strengthened. Thomas Morton's letters reveal that he believed that his legal efforts were paying off and soon the Massachusetts Charter would be revoked, undone, and the old planters could return to their properties. Governor Winthrop, who previously thought that Gorgeous was an ally to settlement in the New World and thus an ally to his causes, by 1634 he knew that Gorgeous was behind all of this. The battle lines had been drawn. His retention of Thomas Morton for legal services just further underscored everything that was going on, and those suspicions were on the mark. Gorgeous laid out for the king a plan for a united New England colony, similar to the one he previously tasked his son with running a decade before. He at the top would be governor general. Mason would be lieutenant governor general. Large strips of land would be granted to different lords. They already had been. But the governing of these subdivisions would be undertaken by crown appointees. Furthermore, an Anglican bishop would be installed over all of it. The proper Anglican church would then have a presence in New England. The King and the Privy Council accepted this, and of course Bishop Loud was a huge fan of it. The people of Massachusetts were right, because this plan, if undertaken, would require the complete submission of the Puritans 
and the separatists to a new order, very much in the feudal model. 1634 to 35, Gorges and Mason began preparations to send a thousand trained soldiers to New England to force this installation of its new government. A European professional army of this size is unheard of in the Northeast. We won't see numbers like this until Peter Stuyvesant decides to take over New Sweden. We won't see numbers like this up in France until after the crown takes over in the 1660s. And the English themselves won't put up similar numbers until their takeover of New Netherland, also in the 1660s. But amidst their attempt to raise a thousand soldiers, there's an uprising in Scotland. Also, the king is losing his grip and control over parliament. And there is a civil war brewing. Furthermore, Gorgeous and Mason spend much of their funds to make a large ship that would serve to be the flagship of their fleet, their Death Star. However, leaving dock, the ship immediately sinks, literally sinking the entire operation. Gorgeous and Mason finding it difficult to proceed without it. Governor Winthrop wrote of this moment that the Lord frustrated their designs, referring to Gorgeous. Not long after that, Mason dies. The very same year. And Governor Winthrop writes that this, this was an example of divine mercy. Massachusetts would be safe for now. Gorgeous lost a great ally in Mason. But he still had Thomas Morton, the lawyer bent on destroying Massachusetts. And Plymouth along with it, if he could do it, they develop yet another scheme. And it involves destroying the Council for New England. The idea being if they dissolved the Council for New England and the power was given back up the chain to the king... The king could individually confirm or deny the validity of each and every plot of land. And this is the moment they were hoping that Massachusetts would be canceled. Returning to the former province of Maine, now the sister colonies of New Somersetshire and New Hampshire, after the death of Mason, Gorgeous sells his minority interest in New Hampshire to Mason's inheritors. However, his family was unable to maintain any sort of of order over New Hampshire, at least at this date, law and order fell to the various Mason employees in the colony who took over and ran all the operations for their own benefit. Moving a little bit north back into New Somersetshire, while Gorgeous was distracted by all the goings on in southern New England and merry old England, the on the ground situation was that the land was lawless. There was no government. Newfoundland law reigned. There were duels. The aforementioned Trelawney writes that Maine lacks any type of government. A man by the last name of Winter who worked for Trelawney, he describes the colony as lawless. The most generous way to describe it is that each locale practiced some form of self-government unofficially. The historian Hannah Farber says that any English order still existed almost exclusively on paper. And so in 1636, with all the plots and plans having fallen apart... Ferdinando Gorgeous sends over his relative William Gorgeous, his title being governor of New Somersetshire. And to aid him, Gorgeous hired one man by the name of George Cleave, who we've mentioned before, who was pushed off his land by these overlapping claims. So he's still in the mix. He'll be important in the next episode. William Gorgeous was the lieutenant at the Plymouth Fort, lieutenant to Ferdinando, as well as his nephew or great nephew. Sometimes the sources vary. He was a decent pick. He had more resolve than Ferdinando's own son, Robert, who had his own failed colony at Wessagusset. He came over to New Somersetshire in 1636. He brought settlers. He brought cattle. He established the seat of government for New Somersetshire at Sacco, which is Sacco, Maine today. Already a settlement, so he didn't have to build from nothing. He created a court of commissioners who would essentially be his deputies. And again, they would be ship captains, essentially. Captain Richard Boynton and Captain Thomas Cummock, who would work out of their respective stations at Sacco and Black Point. We know this very same year, the first Anglican minister shows up in New Somersetshire, and the historian Charles Francis Adams, from the Adams political dynasty, he estimates that around the year 1636, New Somersetshire had about 1,500 English settlers, which isn't very many compared to Massachusetts, but is huge compared to some of the other places we've seen so far in this season, Cape Ann, uh, Numkieg, the Wessagusset, as I keep mentioning, Gosnold's colony, 1,500 people isn't nothing. William Gorgeous opened his first court March 21st, 1636. And although quite promising, more promising than his relative at Wessagusset, early 1637, 
William Gorgeous returns to England, never to return to New Somersetshire. A brief period of authority. Something that plagues these gorgeous colonies is that the Gorgeous family is of very high rank, and they find the New World not to their standards. So they show up, they quickly get sick of having to do anything, and they go home. What's interesting about this is that George Cleave, having heard from Robert Gorgeous that he was resigning his post, goes to England, perhaps with Robert Gorgeous, and convinces Ferdinando to agree to a scheme of governance whereby Cleave would be the lead commissioner over the province of New Somersetshire, along with five other commissioners, whom he named, one including Governor Winthrop of Massachusetts. The interesting thing here is that of those five people, Cleve would be the only one who actually lived in New Somersetshire. And so putting on the appearance of a council, he would essentially be able to set himself up as a mini dictator. Gorgeous agrees to this and grants him a whole bunch of new land, overlapping land owned by Trelawney, his former nemesis. And he was able to push Trelawney's operations straight out of New Somersetshire and enforce this because he was the lone magistrate of the colony who actually resided in the colony. When Cleve is in Massachusetts and he tells Winthrop, hey, you're one of the commissioners in New Somersetshire, Governor Winthrop does not even acknowledge that Ferdinando Gorgeous would have the right to appoint him to such a position because he doesn't acknowledge that Gorgeous has any authority over the Massachusetts colony and thus the jurisdiction in which he resides. Well, in July of that year, 1637, Gorgeous was declared once again governor of New England by the Crown and Privy Council, essentially being given all royal and ample authority over the area. This is a position that would otherwise be called a viceroy, but again, meaningless. Gorgeous had no ability to assert his authority. Cleve, however, in his own little corner of New England and New Somersetshire, most certainly did. Trelawney, back in England, becomes the main source of letters for the anti-Cleave crew. And from one resident of New Somersetshire, he received a letter reporting that Sir Ferdinando Gorgeous hath made Cleave governor of this province, as he reports. Now he thinks to wind all men to his will. With Ferdinando Gorgeous being again elevated to governor of New England, the king officially annuls the Massachusetts Bay Charter. This isn't a situation of an outstanding warrant for the presence of the charter to be examined. The king outright denies the legality of the charter. But again, the man who was supposed to sweep all that away is gorgeous, and he has no ability to do so. Nor does Massachusetts have any willingness to submit. But rather than outright rebel, they simply push off the issue. Rolling into 1637, Thomas Morton, lawyer for gorgeous, former lord of misrule over Marymount, having seen all his legal maneuvers uh, pay off on paper, but in reality have no effect on these people he hates, publishes a book called New England Canaan, which you can read, and it portrays the natives of New England as an innocent pre-fall of man people living in a Garden of Eden-like land. He outlines the injuries he has received personally from being twice removed from property he legally and rightfully owned, that the opportunities of this new promised land have been ruined by this Puritan influx. Captain John Underhill, traveling around New Somersetshire, New Hampshire, having, like so many other people, been rejected by the Puritans, describes them as scribes and Pharisees, villains of the New Testament. A man by the name of Thomas Miller arrives in Boston in the summer of 1636, and he writes that the colony is full of rebels and wasn't displaying the king's colors, mostly thanks to Morton's efforts. In England, the, the assets of the Massachusetts Bay Company are ordered seized, but what, what is there to take? The company has relocated to the New World proper, and then by 1639, Massachusetts had extended its authority northward and had taken over Portsmouth, Dover, Exeter, Hampton. We're entering a strange time when New Hampshire is destroyed and absorbed. And the sister colony of New Somersetshire stands alone, being ruled over by a mini dictator. Men like the aforementioned Underhill, unwilling to deal with the Puritans of Massachusetts, flee north. The different locales of New Somersetshire take them in. But Sir Ferdinando Gorgeous, he's not done fighting against Massachusetts. He's not done fighting for the New England of his vision and for the protection of his own proprietary colony. In 1639, Sir Ferdinando 
finally has his grant, again, that was created upon the demise of the Council for New England, confirmed by the king. He gives Gorgias a royal charter, rejecting New Somersetshire as the name of his colony. The charter reads that Gorgias's New Somersetshire shall forever be called the province and county of Maine, and not by any other name whatsoever. The honest truth is New Somersetshire never really caught on. People were calling the area Maine before this label came about, and to avoid any confusion, the king simply reverted back to the province of Maine. We've seen Maine go from a place where individual English outfits competed and kept their own system of law and order, to the province of Maine being created in 1622, owned by Gorgias and Mason, encompassing a huge swath of land, with the intention of it being part of a larger colony of New England, ruled over by the Council for New England and their appointed governor, Robert Gorgias. That fell apart. Maine had to be on its own for a while. Eventually, Mason and Gorgias again split the colony into two, and the province of Maine became New Hampshire and New Somersetshire, a mostly lawless time. Eventually, another Gorgias relation, William Gorgias, comes to govern over New Somersetshire, and then, just like his relative, leaves as fast as he can. And that sets us up for the next episode, because now we have Massachusetts looking to absorb everything northward. You have Sir Ferdinando Gorgias back in England with this new grant in 1639 for the once again named province of Maine, and then you're going to have this character, George Cleave, who, with the help of Thomas Morton, will make his own breakaway colony. So the next episode, I promise, far fewer people involved, not so scattered, and you already know the major players. The three-way contest for control of northern New England is about to begin. 